Okay, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Rez Manny and I'm uh, working for a company Allied Scientific Pro. Uh, the title of today's webinar is NIRVASCAN Spectrophotometer and the newly introduced cloud service. Uh, I have uh, done this webinar uh, a number of times and every time I try to uh, modify it to include the new activities of the company and also for people who attended for uh, two or more times, it should not be repetitive. The conference will be recorded and uh, the recording will be sent to you within a few days. Uh, my email is also here. You could ask me questions by sending me email. We also have a Q&A session at the end. So we have a long list today to talk about and we try to get as much as possible, uh, but we will definitely cover the important topics. So I'll start by giving some introduction about differences between near IR and mid IR spectroscopy and the need for a portable near IR spectrometer in various applications. Then we'll go into this uh, DLP method, uh, which is digital light processing that NIRVASCAN uses and compare it with linear array detectors. Um, then we would introduce different models of NIRVASCAN which is diffuse reflectance transmission and fiber optic nearest scan models. And then I'll show you how to record a reference uh, uh, and uh, followed by uh, introducing chemometrics, which is quite important for uh, analyzing the near IR data. So we would talk about uh, some cases, sweetness of fruits like grapes and protein, moisture content of wheat kernels. And then after that, I'll go ahead and show you the, uh, the, the cloud service by Allied Scientific Pro uh, and probably spend about 15 minutes demoing the cloud service. And then uh, we would talk about the deep scan demo app followed by some cases studies for each of the, uh, the units, a reflective unit and the transmission unit, the fiber optic unit. Uh, we would talk about flow measurement proposal, the app for the nervous scan, and finally, NIRVASCAN in scientific literature. Some customers always ask us, do you have any papers that show if NIRVASCAN has been used uh, in, in the scientific work? So I'll show you two papers there. Okay, so uh, just giving some introduction, the NIR uh, basically was discovered by William Herschel in 1800. And uh, what he did was, he put the uh, thermometer uh, near the red point of the spectrum uh, on, the, on the right side of it where there was no light and he saw that the temperature rose. So he concluded that there must be some invisible radiation there. And then later on he verified that this invisible radiation also follows the laws of waves such as diffraction, refraction, interference. So here is the near IR right next to the visible region and we define it from 780 to 2500 nanometer. Then the mid IR range is 2.5 to 25 micron and far IR 25 micron to 1 millimeter. So when we think about the interaction of material with light, we have to think in terms of absorbance of frequencies corresponding to molecular vibrations such as uh, uh, stretching, bending, uh, wagging, twisting. Some of these are shown in here, the vibrations of these molecules. Uh, these vibrations have frequencies that lie in the mid IR region of the spectrum. So CO, CH, CN, NH, they have uh, fundamental frequencies in the mid IR and these uh, absorption bands are quite narrow and quite strong. So uh, they are very distinct. However, mid IR has some uh, limitations because uh, uh, if the sample contains too much water, the, the water absorption will swamp all the other uh, signals. So usually it's only used for petrochemicals, plastics, and polymer identif identification. But for fast quantitative analysis, 
uh, of a sample without any sample preparation, then the near IR is used. Although the, <clears throat> in the near IR you have combination bands, like for example, combination of stretching and bending and overtones, which is a multiple of the frequency uh, uh, and they have these overtones are, are less powerful than the fundamentals. They're weaker intensity. And uh, basically, <clears throat> they are also wider. They are not so narrow. But still, uh, you could use these uh, overtones and combination bands. For example, in uh, CH for fat, oil, sugar, OH, water, alcohol, protein, NH, uh, and others. Uh, you can use these signals, which are 100 times weaker than the mid-IR. But, uh, you know, you could do a fast measurement and it is also capable to measure watery materials. So some advantages for NIR versus mid-IR. Okay, next, we are comparing the bands. So on the right, we have the mid-IR bands. Uh, you see uh, the different molecules. These are R and P branches of uh, vibration, rotation uh, spectra. So you see they're pretty strong and they're pretty... Uh, 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 narrow. However, if you compare with the near IR region, you see there are broad bands, which are combination bands or uh, an overtone, and they are quite messy and they are broader. So, in order to make sense of these near IR, you need to use some statistical techniques and chemometrics. You can't just easily analyze it like in the mid IR. So, the need for chemometrics comes into picture when you um, you consider the complexity of the near IR uh, spectrum. So here you can see this, I'm showing the absorption band diagram for uh, near IR spectrometer from 700 to 2500. And these are different overtone regions and this is the combination band region. So <clears throat> As I said, the first overtone is stronger than second overtone, and the second is stronger than third overtone. As you saw in this picture, you can see that the intensity uh, decreases. So the nearest scan instrument that we, we have works from 900 to 1700, and we also have an extended version that works from 1350 to 2150. So the standard mostly covers the second overtone region, whereas the extended covers the first overtone region, okay? So, again, we're looking at some of the limitations of mid-IR. You need to use expensive windows. Uh, you need sample preparation. You can't, you can't measure water solution. Uh, you know, mid-IR instruments are very expensive and they're very slow. And near-IR is a fast, non-destructive technique uh, that could measure the signals without sample preparation. So now let's look at the DLP technique, digital light processing. That was first invented by Texas Instruments, and uh, the chip is being used in, in our NeuroScan instrument. So you can see in a, in a conventional spectrophotometer, you have lights, internal lights, it shines out the sample, and then the diffuse reflectance goes through the slit and the lens, it's the grating, and the grating disperses different uh, wavelengths on the detector array. So each wavelength falls on a different section of the detector array, and then you can see the full spectrum. On the other hand, the D DLP technique does not use a detector array. It replaces, everything else is the same, the optics is the same, only it replaces the detector array with a DLP micromirror array. So these are micro mirrors that turn one by one towards a single point detector. So instead of an array detector, you have a single point detector. And uh, first the blue turns towards it and it records the spec that section of the spectrum, then the green, the yellow, orange, and, and red, and so on. And then fully one by one, they turn uh, the, towards the detector and then they turn away and the next one will turn and then it turns away. So this way you could build the spectrum. So what is the advantage? There are several advantages of using this technique because first of all, you would reduce the cost. It's the DLP micromere array 
is less expensive than the linear array. <clears throat> Secondly, you can increase the size of the single point detector, and that will give you more throughput, improves your signal to noise uh, ratio. And uh, you can also have different scanning patterns. So you could only ask some of these mirrors to turn towards the detector and not all of them if you only inter are interested in a section of the spectrum. So this is the DLP method. And here is the, uh, you can say, model of the nervous scan optical engine. So you see the two lamps here. There's a slit. Uh, this is a diffraction grating. And this is the, uh, the DMD board, the, the digital uh, micromirror device, and the single detector. So it's a pretty small instrument, and it's all mounted on the circuit board. Now we offer three models of a standard nervous scan that is shown here and the range from 900 to 1700 nanometers for all of them. So the diffuse reflectance model is for measuring powders, solids, and grains. It doesn't work for liquids. So you place the window on top of the material and then you press this button or from the app, you press a button and internal lights will come on and you would detect the reflectance from the material. Now the transmission model, you use a glass cuvette, not a plastic cuvette, but a glass cuvette. This plastic has absorption in near IR, so it will affect the results, but gas is, 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 doesn't have any absorption. And then you pour the liquid in there and the light shines from a source into the cuvette and to the detector. We also have a fiber optic model here that doesn't have an internal source. So you could detect uh, near IR by using the fiber optic attached to this, this port. Aside from uh, this uh, uh, um, standard model, we also have extended nervous scan model that works in the 1350 to 2150 nanometer. So basically it, it works in this region so it, it detects the first overtone signals, not the second overtone. The standard does the second, the, the other one, the extended does the first overtone. So this also comes in extended fiber optic model, reflective model, and transmissive model. It has a 10 nanometer resolution and, uh, sorry, 12 nanometer resolution for this one. For the, the standard one is 10 nanometer. And these models are more expensive, by the way. The, the, the nearest scan is about $2,000. And these ones are probably about $5,000 because there's more uh, heat and complexity involved in, in a larger wavelength. But if you want to go at a higher wavelength, you could use this. Now, we also provide the PC software or the GUI for free. And this is some screenshots of that. So you can see it measures a reflectance uh, function, the absorbance function, the reflected intensity, and uh, here's reference and so on. So what is the reference? So for any absorption measurement, you need to know what the intensity of the, the original light was. So this could be either uh, obtained from the built-in function. If you select the built-in, the, in the factory, they had recorded the reference signal already, the I0, basically. And then if you select this, you can directly go ahead and scan. Uh, if you don't select this, you could go to New, and you need to have a, a reflective surface, such as a spectral on, which has more than 97% diffuse reflectance coefficient, and measure your own reference. And then after you do the new, you use previous. So you will use your previous measurement for the uh, as a reference. So when it's a new, it says a scan reference. When it is on built-in, this says a scan. So you can directly scan. So you have the choice. Most of the time, I personally use the built-in function because this is the signal that was recorded in the factory. So, But if you want, you could measure your own as well. 
So the PC software provides you with, so here's the intensity of the reflected signal. This is the uh, absorbance signal, the reflectance signal, sorry, which is I over I zero. And this is the absorbance signal, which is the log of one over R. And R is the reflectance function. So for chemometrics analysis, we always use the absorbance. And this uh, data will also be provided to you in an Excel sheet. So how to calculate it? You know, it, it measures the reflected intensity from the object. It calculates reflectance by dividing this intensity by the, uh, by the factory reference signal, I0. And then it, the software calculates log of 1 over R and gives you the, the absorbance function. For the transmission, this, R, this is replaced by log of 1 over T. The T is the transmission through the liquid. And how to record a reference and use it again? Uh, so this is the surface, the spectral lawn surface that you can buy from a company StellarNet, uh, 50 millimeter diameter and 97% diffuse reflectivity. So you put the window on this and do the measurement and basically use that when, when this is new is selected and then you use previous to uh, basically use that uh, reference. So this way you could use your own uh, reference signal. How to change the scan parameters and record a new configuration? So normally there are some set uh, parameters, like for example, number of scans is six, uh, the exposure time 0.635 uh, uh, seconds. So many customers ask us how you could change these parameters. So you cannot just arbitrarily change this to say 10 and then use the uh, basically factory uh, recorded reference because the factory recorded reference was recorded at with six averages and 0.635 exposure time. So you need to record your own reference so you could define the new parameters and uh, over here in the scan configuration, and then you could um, do a reference measurement, and then you could also use uh, these new parameters to measure with different number of averages and uh, scan time or exposure time. The, the two existing configuration, one is column, uh, which I always use, and then there's the Hadamard, which uh, also a, a good uh, scan configuration. The Hadamard can create a set with several wavelengths, which are multiplexed at a time, and decodes the individual wavelengths, and the scan collects more light and offers great signal-to-noise ratio than column. So if you're very concerned about your signal-to-noise ratio, you could use Hadamard. For the app, what you can do is you can go to Quick Set, and there you can change the parameters. You don't need to record a new reference. Just a quick set, uh, and then you can change, diff use a different number of scans and exposure time. You can do over pl overlay plot in the, uh, the PC software. If you have saved scans, as you can save the scans. They're all in there. Whatever you measure, all these will be recorded. So you could come select them and compare them by doing an overlay plot as shown here. All right, so now let's uh, go to chemometrics. And as I said, uh, uh, doing an IR without chemometrics is, is very difficult. In fact, making the measurements is just the beginning. The main job and the main difficult part is to analyze the spectra. So you need to have some knowledge of uh, chemometrics if you really want to be effective in near IR. Although for very few applications, you can also get away without this. Like if you just want to qualitatively compare if something has an additional component or not, you could use without chemometrics. But for quantitative and for many of the qualitative uh, cases, you need to use chemometrics. So there are two methods, the principal component analysis, the PCA, where it's used for sorting. So you would measure different spectra and they basically pile in different regions. When you do the 
uh, principal component analysis and plot the, this is the score plot, what they call. So the first principal component versus the second principal components. And these principal components basically are defined as a, a linear combinations of all the variables of some of the, some of the variables that are making a difference in the spectrum. So you can see these are all Y on one kind. These are all another kind. I'll show you, I'll show you some uh, examples when I, 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 I talk about the cloud. And you can also do the quantitative evaluation with the partial least square or PLS, where you have to build a calibration model and then apply that calibration model to your validation or test model. You need to measure the ingredient uh, independently using an analytical technique and have uh, all the values uh, for your calibration set as, and also the spectrum. So here is, for example, one uh, a software mini tap that I've used here to, to measure uh, bricks from grapes and it will give you a table of the predicted values and give you our square value of 0.9. So you can see there's a plot of predicted versus measured and uh, ideally it should be a linear line with the slope of one as shown here. So here's another uh, example. It's called the multivariant analysis there's a, there's a webinar by Dr. Heather Brooks from Camo Analytics, and uh, here uh, she sets up uh, this spreadsheet. Uh, they have this unscramble software, so you can see how the data is being arranged. Uh, the the first row has all the wavelengths, so all the wavelengths are variables. That's why we call it the multivariant analysis. And the absorbance spectra are along the rows. So these are all uh, rows are all absorbance spectra. And the first column is what you want to measure, the protein, for example. So all the values that you measured using your analytical method are in the in the first column. So for this spectra in, in line one, the protein is 6.7. And for this one is 6.8 and so on. And then you build your model based on this. This is how the data has to be set in your uh, in your uh, spreadsheet. So let me give you some example. We have a customer in France that works in the area of uh, uh, wine grapes, and he's very much interested to uh, give the uh, the farmers some idea about the quality of grapes that they're harvesting, and uh, he sent us these. Uh, measurements about uh, 53 spectra that we used for calibration and he had measured the bricks content or the sugar content which is bricks is a scale of uh, basically uh, showing number of grams of pure uh, uh, sugar contained in 100 ml of water this is how bricks is defined so one bricks is uh, one gram in 100 ml of water so he had measured with this uh, very accurate analytical instrument, which is called the BRICS meter. So gave us the spectra and gave us the, the values of BRICS. And then you also have to do some pre-processing uh, to get better results because these are all offset with respect to each other. They have DC offset. So you need to apply second derivative to get rid of that offset. And this is a standard technique, the second derivative, where the peak would lie in the same area as the original spectrum. But after you do the second derivative, you also need to apply a filter to remove the noise. So you need to give a number of points uh, for the savitsky golay filter, and then that will fit uh, a curve, a smooth curve, quadratic curve to those. So you will get rid of the noise. So these are standard techniques uh, the second derivative and savitsky Gole for pre-processing the data. And then after, or this is what the spectrum looks like after you apply uh, the second derivative and savitsky Gole. Uh, so this is the, uh, basically, the measured versus actual. So from for the calibration set, and we applied that to uh, a test set 
the model was applied to this test set whose real values are given here. And we got a good R square value from predicted, val predicted uh, results, 0.87. So R squared is defined in here where uh, you basically, it's actually one uh, minus the unexplained variance over the total variance. So what does that mean? So you would subtract uh, these two and square them. That will give you this and then sum them, sum all of these. And then here you calculate the average of real and sub subtract that from each point and square them and sum them. So the ratio and then one minus that ratio will give you the R square. So the better is the fit. Uh, so if this one is zero, the numerator is zero, and R square is one. So it means the better is the fit, the higher is R square. So here we've got R square of 8.87. You can also uh, uh, calculate the error by using root mean square. And this is how you define it. So basically add up, square all of these differences and add them up and average them and then take the square root and that will give you the root mean square so we got a root mean square of 0.77 which is pretty good here is another example where we uh, have a customer in manitoba that deals with the uh, uh, wheats and for wheat farmers they need to know the protein content of their wheat because the price of wheat the, depends on the protein content. The higher the price of the wheat, the higher the protein content, the higher is the price of the wheat. So we also need to measure the moisture because they need to have that information for storage. Uh, so more uh, moist wheat requires special care for storage because it gets spoiled very quickly. So they get 140 wheat kernel calibration spectra and 15 spectra for checking these are for validation and all these uh, content of this was measured using the grain analyzer uh, instrument which is uh, quite expensive it's about twenty thousand dollars and so you put the wheat in there and it will give you the actual protein and moisture so we want to do this with a two thousand uh, dollar nearby scan instrument instead so after applying the filters and uh, pre-processing the signal basically for both calibration and validation. Uh, we ran the model and we saw that we have a very good result for the moisture. So moisture RMSC root mean square error of 0.47 and not good results for uh, protein, 1.73%, which is not good. You don't want to have something below 0.5 basically for it to be acceptable. So we're wondering why that is. And then when I looked at the, the, the predicted versus real curve, I noticed that there are gaps in the calibration set. So here and here, there are gaps. So if you want to run this whole model uh, for the whole ca calibration set, which is also from uh, anywhere from, you can say 12.7 to 19.2, you get poor results because you don't have enough spectra in these regions. So we, I did apply the model only to this section, which has a good uh, condensation, a good density of points. And uh, when I did that, I, I got a really good value. So RMSC of 0.52%. So for this reason, we have asked the manufacturer, the supplier to find more uh, samples in these regions and these regions if you want to do prediction for the whole thing in from 12 to 19 then we need more spectra in these gaps so that our model becomes a stronger and now uh, I would just go ahead and introduce the allied scientific cloud service or near the cloud so before we've been selling near scan for many years and many customers were asking us, okay, so what do we do with the spectra? Do you have a software that would give us the ingredient that we want, whether it's a protein or moisture or uh, bricks or fat? Uh, so how do we do that? So for this reason, we developed this cloud service, and it is uh, basically 
Python based and it's on the Heroku platform, which is a free platform for open source web framework. And there you could upload spectra near IR profiles. You could plot individual spectrum and NIR profiles. You could do PCA, principal component analysis, PLS modeling. You could apply uh, pre-processing. Uh, and uh, basically, you could subscribe to this. If you purchase a NervaScan for a period of one year, and uh, you, can, you can use it for free. So I will uh, have recorded one video on this to introduce that better which I will, I will send you basically. So I will send you this on the chat. You could look at it later if you like. Uh, it will talk about the different features of the cloud, but I will also, I will also go ahead and, and show you the Nirva cloud. So this is the main page. Of course, you have to have a password to get in and uh, we also uh, care about uh, customer privacy. So your spectra would only be seen by you and the administrators of the site. The other customers cannot see your spectra. So let me start this and go to the, to the main page. You, for the main page, you need to click on the uh, nearby scan, the blue line. So the, the, the cloud, has many capabilities that are useful for the customer to be able to evaluate the data. So one thing about this cloud is this is a free platform. And then I'll show you another platform, uh, which is not free, uh, you have to pay for it. So basically we are moving towards that other platform, which is AWS, I'll show you that later. So once you get to the cloud, you see this thing, and uh, here, for example, if you click on the spectra, you can see there are different spectra. If you want to put a picture of it, you can do it. And then here is, for example, for wine, you can just go and plot the spectra. Okay. And if you want to add one spectra, for example, you made the measurement with NervaScan, you could just go add the spectra and add, and you fill out some information here. And then you copy the absorbance from the Excel sheet directly into here and then give a minimum maximum range for the for the scales and it will just add that but normally we don't use a uh, single spectra we you, we tend to use the uh, nir profiles this is what we tend to use because you know you would have maybe 100 spectra that you took from fish for example or from wheat and you want to have you build your calibration model you need about 100, at least 100 spectra. So how to do that? Here are some of the existing spectra, for example. Like here, for example, I'm just going to plot this wheat K. This is K for kernel and Cal for calibration, and it's for moisture. So let's plot them. <clears throat> so... <clears throat> The software will plot all of that. Just give it a few seconds. So there you go. So the labels could be removed. Uh, so you remove the label. And these are all the 140 spectra that you can see. You could do high resolution if you want. And uh, you could reverse it. If you, It's a dynamic software. So, so, so the question is that how you would import this you cannot you don't want to spend your time doing it one by one so if you want to import this you go to uh your your all your measurements should be in one file and then you give it a title and there's some information to fill out in here and then you can just import an excel file that has all the information upload data set so the excel file looks very much like uh, what I showed you uh, before on our uh, for the for one of the slides which was uh, I'm just going to show you the, this one yeah it looks very much like this one so you can see that in the first line you have to have your spectra in the first row 
uh, the different wavelengths, I mean, the different wavelengths, and then all the spectral are horizon in horizontal rows, and the first column has your ingredient. I can actually show you one of these, uh, one of these spectra. So let me let me show you one. For example, yeah, for example, sorry. So let me see if I can find one that I can show you. Yeah, there you go. This is one of them. So you can see the uh, the wavelengths are all in this row from 901 all the way goes to basically 1700 right on the top. And this one is the first first spectrum, the first absorption spectrum. And these are all the protein content. So once you build your spreadsheet like that, you could just import it all at once. And so you don't need to do it one by one. You could just import your spectra into the cloud and uh, and go ahead from there. Let me, let me show you. This is where we were. Okay, good. Okay. All right. So what do we do after that? After we plot this uh, in our profile, one we can do is we could apply the savitsky gole filter to them, which has a second derivative. So if you put the add, you could choose a number of points and then choose one of these and then save it. And that will give you the savitsky gole version. So, for example, here are the savitsky gole profiles for wheat cal, wheat k cal. I'm going to plot it, and you see the second derivative. This is not going to be the original, but it's going to be second derivative with the savitsky gole applied to that. And you do that for both uh, calibration and validation. And then you would build, after you do that, you can go ahead and build your model, your PLS model. So you can tell the number of components, for example, 20 components. And you build a model, uh, a PLS model. So we have already built some models here that I can show you, for example. So these are PLS models. Okay. So you want to apply this calibration model to a validation model. And this already has savitsky gole applied to it with the 15 components. So you go ahead and select it. And then you would try to find the same corresponding value. Uh, so it will be validation. So you would select this and apply the model. And this is giving you this uh, with our square 0.2986. So this is all the predictions are given here, the real value and predicted, the real value and predicted. So this will do the modeling for you and make the predictions. And we are also uh, doing a, a little addition here that you should export an Excel file. What is the uh, real value and the predicted value? So you could work with that. Uh, you also have uh, the PCA models. If you want to sort out different uh, things, for example, you have fish that is uh, rotten and fish that is fresh. And you want to be able to, to to sort them out. So you have a collection of a spectra for fresh fish, and then you have a collection of spectra for rotten fish. And if you do a PCA model, they get separated in the score plot. And I'll show you one example here. For example, uh, the PCA models. Right now, we don't have a PCA model, but we could make a PCA model. So for example, I'm going to make, uh, for example, the protein, calc protein, and then we just do the, for example, this one. And then we just do a PCA model. Yeah, so you would see that they are separated from each other. You can see the orange ones are wheat. And this one is the salinity of fish. So if you do a new measurement and if it falls here, let's say if this was not salinity and wheat, but this was rotten and this was fresh, then if your new spectrum falls in this bunch, then you know it's a fresh fish. If it is here, then it's, it's a rotten fish. So these are some of the features of that. But uh, this uh, uh, free platform, Heroku, has some limitations. So for this reason, we went to the Nirva Cloud on AWS, which is a paid service. 
and uh, this uh, is much better, much faster. Here's, for example, one PCA where we plotted three types of tomatoes on this side versus durum, which is type of a wheat for pasta in blue and wheat. And they gets very, very much separated in clusters. Very nice. This new platform has uh, much easier capabilities. So, for example, if you want to add profile, you don't have to do that form again. You just have to choose the file and give it a title and then upload. And it will just go ahead and read all the information about the, the axis, minimum, maximum, everything from the from the file, the nervous scan Excel file, and uh, it will it will plot. So let's plot, for example, one. So if we go here, and this is just one. So let's say this one, plot. It plot. It's much faster and it's much cleaner. So this is still under construction, but eventually we'll be offering this to the customers. At the moment, if someone buys the nervous scan, they could use the Heroku Cloud. Uh, service all right so this is uh, my demo on that on the cloud so let's move on because we have lots of stuff to cover but uh, uh, here's again some uh, PCA models these are tomatoes and this is grape uh, this is the durum this is garlic they are all separated in clusters and this is a PCA model has a high R square of 0.86. Sorry, PLS model. Sorry, my bad. PLS model. Now, a lot of customers are asking, is it possible to have an app that could communicate with the cloud? So rather than going to the, to the platform on a PC, you want to do a measurement, and the app sends the, uh, the, the spectrum directly to a cloud. The cloud does the analysis and then it sends it back to the customer so this kind of app we only have a demo demo of it we are still working towards it it's definitely possible but it will take some time to make and the deep scan demo app is uh, is showing the concept so i will send you one uh, uh, youtube video which you could watch and i have done some measurements using this app where I measured the sweetness of a fruit or fat in the body or plastic uh, percentage of polyester and just do the measurement and then the app immediately communicates with the cloud and the cloud sends the percentages back by analyzing it. So let me send you this uh, right away and you can look at it if you like later. If you'd like to copy these links so that you could look at them later, it would be great. Um, so, for example, you can see here we uh, this is the the screen, the app screen. So I measured the, the mango and do a near scan measurements of the mango, put it on the surface, and it just gave me the bricks directly, 16.1, and it also classifies it as super sweet. Or here I did a measurement from my own body fat. Uh, on my arm and then it will just give me the body body fat and basically also tells me that I'm obese so <laughs> it was also it also classifies which uh, how what is the what is the classification of your fat or how sweet a fruit is so we would provide you with the software development kit and you could go ahead and develop your own app and we are also moving towards building that app right now, but still a few months away from communicating with the cloud. We already managed to directly save on the cloud when you do a measure from the error scan, directly go to the cloud. But the response back, we're still working on that. So uh, let's uh, move on to some of the other applications. We had another customer that uh, had uh, some fabrics sent to us. And he told us that one of the fabrics has some additional ingredients. And this is an example where you can see just the visual inspection of the spectra is enough. You don't need to do chemometrics. So here, sample number seven showed an extra peak. Uh, and this peak, uh, which is around uh, less than a thousand nanometers, uh, 
it corresponds to an aromatic ingredient, which is toluene. So qualitative anal analysis is possible by comparing the spectra. You can see the number seven only had an extra peak. So this is the one that has an additional ingredient. Uh, so you can also do a PCA analysis with this. And the customer was interested in content of polyester and polypropylene. Here we did some measurements for uh, fake masks. So the uh, 3M mask has the polypropylene in it and it has a distinct CH3 bond that we saw. The other uh, masks did not show that peak. So this was uh, used for uh, measuring uh, the, the content of a mask. You can also do case studies for identification of plastics uh, so uh, normally now the way it works in the recycling companies, the workers actually separate different uh, plastics based on their code. But you could develop a, a, an IR system with a hyperspectral camera that identifies different objects spectrally. And then uh, uh, some kind of air flows from a nozzle to, to separate these different plastics into different bins. So that's very much the path of the future. There will no longer be a need for workers to separate these. You can just do it intelligently using hyperspectral camera and uh, some mechanical systems. Now, uh, some customers were asking if it's possible to um, basically put your material on a rail and uh, do a dynamic measurement. Ideally, you need to have the window attached or, or right on top of the object. Otherwise, your signal to noise ratio is not good. But if you just leave maybe one or two millimeters distance, as shown here, I'm measuring from the surface of this aluminum piece. So I'll show you this. So you could see that the two lights, the two uh, uh, spots that from the two lamps here for a copper plate. So it is possible to do a measurement like that. And the software also has a feature where you can do back-to-back -back measurements. So you could specify how many back-to-back -back measurements you want at what interval and then uh, let it roll basically underneath the nervous scan. If there's only a few millimeters difference, it will work. So here I put a piece of tape on the aluminum and I, I moved it with the translation stage and it could distinguish between uh, the part that was covered with the tape and the part that was bare aluminum. So here is uh, the tape uh, shows very smooth spectra and the one that has no tape shows a little a noisier. So you could potentially use that uh, in a very slow way though. You don't cannot do it really fast. You got to give it a little time to do the measurement, but you can put your your material on some rail and let it move underneath nervous scan. Here are again uh, some other applications. I'm not going into details of these but NeuroScan has been used for identifying Zika virus in, uh, in these mosquitoes. Basically, uh, by doing a principal component analysis, and uh, you can also do the PLS analysis, you could compare uh, uninfected and infected uh, ones together. These are absorbances. The, the spectra look different. And you can also do a PCA model and then distinguish which one is infected, which one is not infected. This is much simpler than unskilled technicians who want to do this. Uh, uh, sorry, this is much more simpler than experienced technicians that are required for other methods, such as PCR, the polymerase chain reaction. This one can be used uh, near IR. An unskilled technician can do the measurement uh, quickly and it's much faster to identify the, the dangerous mosquito that carries the virus. 
here so uh, uh, other examples where customers sent us uh, some liquids uh, we used the nervous scan uh, transmission model which comes with the cuvette and uh, measure the content of these this was used for medical imaging and interestingly we found that uh, when we used the 10 centimeter thick uh, cuvette we didn't get a signal past 1400 nanometer because of the water uh, absorption was so strong and nothing came through but for this reason we made uh, a three millimeter thick cuvette and then we saw that the peak after 1400 nanometer appeared so for some measurements you need to use thinner cuvette and they're available in the market like three millimeter one millimeter if you're interested in signals past 1400 sometimes you need to use a smaller thick uh, thinner cuvette another customer that uh, sent us some uh, detergent uh, material and you can see here we didn't even have to use it use a thinner cuvette the same 10 centimeter cuvette gave a good signal past uh, 1400 nanometer so we gave him the spectrum uh, here is another uh, application where you can use nervous scan and chemometrics to uh, detect viral diseases and uh, using PCA and PLS models I'm not going to go into details of these uh, here's one where they actually detected the flu virus nasal fluid so using the near IR spectroscopy they looked at the nasal fluid from many samples that they collected and uh, they had already identified which one is a, a flu which one is not flu and then when they did the PCA analysis they could distinguish between the non-influenza and influenza this is the PCA model that separated the two although we couldn't separate the influenza from another type of disease RSV infected which is respiratory syncytial virus uh, these could not separate this but it could separate influenza from non non-influenza so sometimes the PCA model works and some other times it doesn't here also are uh, other uh, nervous scan the fiber optic model that doesn't have an internal source so here I measured the spectrum by uh, attaching a fiber uh, to this I, I looked at the scattered light from a halogen tungsten lamp and I measured the spectrum now some of our customers are asking is it possible to do absorption measurement using the fiber optic model so yes it is but you need to use a bifurcated fiber sensor so here's a bifurcated fiber sensor that has two inputs and one output so uh, one input goes to a spectrometer one input goes to the light source which we can also provide and the first step would be to measure a reference by using the standard which I already talked about and then replace replace it with remove it and replace it with the actual sample do second measurement and then you can calculate the absorption spectra it's definitely more difficult to do the absorption measurement with the fiber optic model than with the reflective model there's also another application for fiber optic model where you can uh, measure from a flow system so if you have say uh, some kind of sweet drink uh, there's a source and sink that flows through this uh, uh, this cell and uh, you could shine the light through a fiber optic uh, in this flow and then measure the transmittance to, through the fiber optic model so for flow measurements we also do provide the fiber optic uh, source for this measurement now the ISC NIR app so you know that you can you can use this uh, with the with the PC software or with the app which would communicate via Bluetooth to with the uh, with the app so here is really how to use uh, uh, NIR and uh, nervous scan spectrometer I'm gonna actually send you this because we don't have time to to, to go uh, go through it so there's one video which I recorded for the 
app for the iOS devices, and there's another uh, another one that is recorded for the basically V for Android devices. So please copy these these uh, links, and you can look at it later. In case you purchase the instrument, you know you would have these uh, videos that show how the app works. So I'm going to send you these very quickly. Yes, right here, right here, and sent. Okay, so that's there. So next, uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, talk about near, near, nervous scan uh, in scientific literature. It's actually nervous scan. Sorry, I've missed one BA in there. So uh, some customers were asking us, like, uh, is there a scientific literature that talks about this? And recently we found two papers that talked about this. The first paper about the evaluation of low-cost portable near infrared for rapid analysis of soils from southeastern Australia. In this paper, they compared nervous scan with another uh, micro spectrometer, mini spectrometer, uh, which was $5,000, and two very expensive, larger scale spectrometers of $50,000, which are gold standards. And they found that nervous scan actually uh, could predict uh, very well uh, some of the characteristics. So, for example, similar performance for total carbon, sand, and improved prediction in clay. So it also did not have bad performance for total carbon. You can see R square 0.73, clay 0.73. Uh, they're all total carbon, and some of the minerals were predicted. So it did pretty well in these measurements. And there was another a paper about the quality of seafood to determine which is the spoiled and which is fresh seafood. And uh, in this paper, they did the PCA model. This is a three-dimensional PCA model, and they could separate the, the one from the other with the spoiled fish from the fresh fish. So these are both, uh, if you write to me, I can send you these papers if you're interested. So in conclusion, uh, we found that the nervous scan reflective model showed prom promising results for application related to food industry, textile, health monitoring, plastics for recycling, moving geometry, and both quantitative and qualitative measurements were possible. The transmission model was used to detect absorption peaks from liquids, and we found that this one centimeter thick cuvette sometimes uh, swamps the signals past 1400 nanometer, but if you reduce the thickness, you could see those signals. The fiber model successfully measured the spectrum of quartz halogen lamp and also could be used for flow and absorption measurements and also for um, uh, absorption measurements from wheat uh, if you have a bifurcated fiber. Uh, we strongly recommended the use of chemometrics such as PCA and PLS models. For, for analyzing the spectra and finding moisture, protein, bricks, um, and basically content. Um, they, our measurements or our models were quite successful. And we talked about the cloud service that is available for a period of one year for free for everyone who buys the nearest scan spectrometer. Uh, feel free to use that and analyze your data. And we are working towards creating an app that can communicate two ways with the cloud, and the user will be able to save the spectrum on the cloud and receive the necessary information from the cloud, uh, the result of the analysis, whether it's PCA or PLS. So we are right on time. It's 3 o'clock now. Thank you very much for listening to the webinar. We'll also send you a... A webinar feedback form if you want to fill it out if you have any suggestions for improving the webinar or if you have any questions feel free to write it in the feedback form so at this point I will 
uh, ask the audience if they have any questions, please feel free to to unmute yourself or you could also write in the chat box and I will be glad to answer your questions. Are there any questions? Many thanks for the webinar. Can we get the, uh, Matthias, we, we would just provide the, we would provide the, the recording for the webinar. We normally don't uh, uh, provide the PowerPoint. We only provide the, the recording, which will has all the information there. So you'll get it within a few days. All right, any other question? Yeah, so my email is also, I'm going to write it again. If you think of something later and you need to ask me, please feel free to do so. rmanny at alliedscientificpro.com. So if there are no other questions, I thank you once again for attending the webinar and wish you a happy afternoon. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye.